Okay. Okay. I'm Ed Nersessian, director of the Helix Center. Before we begin today's program, I would like to thank our program coordinator, Alex Hurwitz, for his hard work in putting our programs together and for making sure they run smoothly. Especially during the pandemic, this has required much work and Alex has been up to the challenge. I would also like to thank Miguel Noguera of Multimind, who has made it possible for us to continue our programs on Zoom and to reach a broader audience by posting them on YouTube and our website. Today's program on placebo nocebo was proposed and implemented by Beverly Zabriskie, a member of the Helix Executive Committee, and she will be moderating the discussion. For those of you who may recall, there was a program at the Philoctetes Center years ago on this very same sub topic. And it will be interesting to find out how the thinking has evolved on this subject. Before turning the discussion over to Beverly, I would like to let you know about our upcoming programs. In April, we will be picking up the topic of stress. And sometime in May, we hope to organize a discussion on poetry tentatively focused on early 14th century expressions of this art form. And now Beverly will uh, introduce the participants. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Zoom iteration of the Helix Roundtables. We are in little rectangular squares rather than in a circle, but the sensibility of the program will follow that wonderful circular exchange among persons from many different backgrounds on a specific to uh, topic. Um, we will we are missing, we will be four today rather than five, as one of the speakers was unable to attend, Phoebe Frisson. And it's my pleasure to introduce these people. Some of them know each other, for some it's a blind date. And I congratulate you on your courage to um, negotiate such a situation. I'm only going to read the titles of, and you know, just the major posts of each of the participants and then ask each one to reintroduce themselves and tell us what their work has been, what led them to it, and what their focus is right now. So, Luana Coloca, born in Italy, we just found out, and she's on the faculty at the University of Maryland in Baltimore. She has a master's degree in bioethics and a PhD in neuroscience and completed a postdoc training in Stockholm. And she's going to be telling us what she's what she is now delving into. Catherine Hall is the feminine spiritrice of this program. I heard Catherine in June of 2019 at a Science of Consciousness conference in Interlaken, and I was so impressed that among the 750 participants at that conference, I swore that I would find a way to bring her to Helix. So Catherine, I so appreciate your willingness to participate in this. And she's Director of Basic and Translational Research at the Osher Center for Integrative Medicine, an Assistant Professor of Medicine in the Division of Parenting preventive medicine at Brigham's and Women's Hospital and Harvard Medical School. She received her PhD in microbiology and molecular genetics from Harvard University, where she spent 10 years in the biotech industry, tackling problems in drug discovery and development. And then she became an associate director of drug development at Millennium Pharmaceuticals, now Takeda and she will tell you what else she has done in her very full life. Gerald Horowitz is a fellow member of the Helix um, Executive Committee. He's assistant professor of clinical psychiatry and on the faculty at Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons. He practices psychopharmacology and neuropsychiatry and he's a founder and chief medical officer at M3 Information, an information technology company that focuses on mental health and integration into primary care. 
And Robert Klitzman is another man who is an inspiration. And again, I'm very grateful he agreed to join today. He's a professor of psychiatry at the College of Physicians and Surgeons in the Mailman School of Public Health and the director of the online and in-person bioethics master's and certificate program at Columbia University. He's written over 150 scientific journals and concentrated on the psychiatry doctor patient relationship and other areas. And his some of his many books are listed on the website. And he's also received numerous awards. So um, I, I knew a bit about placebos from myth and opera and drama, love potions and all that. But when I looked it up, just to get a little bit more intelligent notions to express here, I was really surprised to find out the placebo comes from the opening line of the Catholic Church Vespers. And on the one hand, it means I shall be pleasing. And on the other hand, it means I shall please the Lord in the land of the living from the Vespers for the dead. I had no idea of that link. And also of the different ways in the different centuries, the idea of placebos went from sham to an essential aspect of cure. And so I'm hoping, you know, that this discussion, and I know it will, address this notion of placebo in, in many various ways. So Luana, could you tell us more about your work? Thank you very much, uh, Beverly, and everyone uh, for uh, the opportunity to talk about placebo. My lab at University of Maryland is funded by the National Institutes of Health to study the neurobiology and phenotypes of placebo responders. The goal is to understand the neurobiology of placebo, and it is fascinating to learn how many patients experience benefits because of placebo effects. And our goal is to try to understand behind the cultural aspects that is fascinating, the anthropological component, how our brain can uh, trigger changes in a cascade of neurobiological uh, substances to produce reduction of pain, reduction of anxiety, reduction of mood. So the goal is really to trigger the mechanistic aspects of placebo effects. And a little bit I got uh, into this area of research because as soon as I finished my degree in medicine, um, I decided to start a PhD in neuroscience. In this switch from medicine to neuroscience, always I want to reconcile the medical approach with the neurobiological approach and try to go back and translate and bring back harness what we learn to the bedside. How can we improve patient health? Catherine, would you tell us about your background and work? Sure. So, um, as you said, I'm at Brigham and Women's Hospital and the Osher um, Center for Integrative Medicine at Harvard Medical School and Brigham and Women's Hospital. And my focus is on understanding the genetics of the placebo response, or I should say the genomics of the placebo response. We became really interested in that um, when we were trying to figure out um, if, firstly, if there were actually genes that were associated with placebo response. But very soon after we found several genes that we think are associated with placebo response, we rapidly um, became aware of a very interesting interaction that seems to be happening with the genes and the drugs. Um, as if the drugs are perturbing placebo responses in, um, in a subset of patients depending on their genotype. So a very complex kind of web of interactions. And so I, my background is as a geneticist. Um, and I, as you said, spent um, I think a total of 15 years um, in a pharmaceutical industry manufacturing um, drugs. And the, certainly the placebo response is the bane of the um, pharmaceutical 
um, drug developer in particular in, in neurobiology um, and psychology, psychological conditions, developing drugs for, you know, pain, depression, schizophrenia, irritable bowel syndrome, we're often um, have to deal with these high placebo responses and really understanding why has been an interest of mine. Um, as Luana knows, I've spent um, some time over the last year writing a book on placebos um, called The Placebo Paradox. And I have been amazed at what I've learned, um, taking a deep dive, as you kind of mentioned, um, into the history of placebos and all the way to the current times to understand why and how they're influencing us um, in clinical medicine and in clinical trials and drug development today. Maybe I can join in. I, I thought um, I would say something about my perspective, which is from being a, a clinician uh, treating patients, usually mostly through a biological treatment form, uh, psychopharmacology. Although I'm always mindful that patients experience and uh, the phenomenology of their experience is important to them, of course, and plays a role in their getting well or not. It's interesting, I've often confronted this comment by some of my patients who will say, oh, this is a chemical depression, or I can tell this is not a chemical depression. <laughs> and I'm sorry, I have like a little bit of a smug sense of the, uh, I have to chuckle about that because I thought, I don't know how one could tell such a thing, but in any case, I often come back with the following. I say, you know, um, everything that you think and feel is reflected in your brain. There's some biological aspect of it. The question is, is it relevant in trying to get you better to take a hold of your problem from a biological sort of end of things or from a talk psychological end of things? And of course, sometimes you need both. But it's interesting to think that when we think of the placebo effect, it seems to me even the term itself, placebo effect, suggest almost like a bio, well, anyway, and for, for most of us now in modern times, and kind of a biological, and we're, we're, we're thinking, well, how does it impact the brain? And so, but every interaction that's not strictly speaking, pharmacological impacts the brain physically also. I mean, our thinking and our talking does that. So I was wondering as I came up into this really fascinating topic, to what degree is the placebo effect just like thinking and talking anyway? How do, what, <laughs> what properties do they share? Because our thinking and talking affects our biology. Right. I found one saying about it, which was cure occasionally, relieve always, console often. I thought it's a description of what the placebo does. Robert. Tell us about your work and the ethical implications of this. You have to unmute. Uh, yes, thank you for the invitation to be here and what a wonderful panel and uh, center you have. And I'm really pleased to, to meet some of you and be part of it. I thought I'd talk about how I got interested in a number of areas I work on, which is closely related to placebo. And that is when I was in college, I was deciding what I wanted to do when I grew up, as many of us do, and I was interested in the brain, but also the mind and the humanities and didn't know what to do. So I got a job at the NIH at the Center Laboratory for Central Nervous System Studies uh, for a man named Carlton Geideshek, who just won the Nobel Prize for studying diseases in Stone Age tribes around the world and finding a number of them, particularly one called Kuru in Papua New Guinea uh, that ended up being the same as mad cow disease. And so when I graduated college, he sent me to live with a Stone Age tribe for a year in Papua New Guinea studying Kuru, which is caused by, we now know, a prion. Uh, and uh, the disease had wiped out uh, two thirds of the tribe. And so I would meet shamans who said that they could cure the disease. It was spread by cannibalistic rituals. When someone died, their loved ones would eat the person. Uh, this, the, the people would say to me this, well, always a part of my mother inside of me. Uh, and uh, it's a long story. I actually wrote a book about it called The Trembling Mountain, a personal account of who cannibals and mad cow disease. But when I met the shaman, he claimed that he had cured many, many people of the disease. And I said, uh, what's the treatment? At this point, the uh, cannibalism had stopped the few, about 20 years before, but anyone who had a headache thought they had the disease. And he said, uh, I have a treatment. What is it? I asked him. We had not had any treatment for this in the US and the West. He said, it's very simple. I... Um, 
tell people that for two weeks they're not allowed to drink water or have salt or touch a member of the opposite sex. I give them some herbs and I cast a spell on them. Uh, and I said, well, who have you cured? And he said, all these people here. And he pointed to 20, 30 people who were around me. And he said he cured them. And I said, well, have you not cured anyone? He said, yes, that one person over there who was the one person I had diagnosed with the disease. Uh, and I said, well, how come he didn't get better? He said, very simple, he didn't follow the treatment. Uh, but what struck me is how there was no treatment available. And so people out of desperation strongly believe that this disease was caused by sorcery, could be cured by sorcery. I should say one other anecdote on this. Uh, the uh, uh, people believe that a sorcerer would take something that belonged to you and wrap it around a stone and bury it. People would hide their belongings. And so it was said that sorcerers could even just take food scraps and wrap it around from you, wrap it around a stone. And they'd dig up stones and say, see this stone here? This is the stone that killed my mother. And I'd say, no, coup is caused by a little thing like an insect. And they said, show it to us. And I said, it's mm -hmm. too small to see, you need a special machine. And they'd say, well, what does it look like? And I'd say, we don't know. We hadn't identified it. They said, well, have you seen it? I'd say, no. And they'd say, that's just magic. It's a stone that killed my mother. So I got very interested in how do we understand what is a disease? How do we understand what is a treatment? How do we define these things? And how desperation can lead to us to think that things may or may not get better, certainly relieve anxiety. The disease had wiped out, as I said, two thirds of the tribe. Uh, and from that, I ended up getting interested in ethics in a number of ways. I can very briefly, my first day as an intern in a hospital, I was given a list of patients. I was told, go take care of them. I met the first one, a woman cutting her grapefruit, complaining the grapefruit wasn't fresh. I went out in the hall and my resident said, what have you done so far? I said, I spoke to Mrs. So-and-so. He said, she's dead. Don't waste your time with the dead. I said, what do you mean she's dead? I just spoke with her. He said, she's dead. And in her mind, she was DNR, do not resuscitate. And therefore, uh, don't waste your time with her. Just mm. ignore her. And my heart froze. Uh, and I thought, gee, how are we defining who we spend time with and who we don't? How are we defining what is life? What's death? Who is going to live? Who is going to die? Who am I to be making these decisions? So that got me interested in ethics. And since then, I've done a lot of work. I wrote a book called Am I My Genes? Confronting Fate and Family Secrets in the Age of Genetic Testing, Understanding how do we understand genes and the roles in our lives, et cetera. But so I would say overall, I take some might say anthropological perspective to try to understand how patients and doctors understand what is treatment, what its effects are, et cetera. And I've looked at in various contexts uh, and uh, look forward to the discussion today. So please feel free just to start to engage with each other and what your thoughts and afterthoughts are. And I'm sure this is going to be very fertile. Gerald, I was curious to know what you um, understand from your patients when they tell you they have chemical, it's, that their depression is chemical. Like, what does that mean? Well, there's a, there's a, you know, there, it's interesting. There are a wide range of people who will use that phrase. Um, I can usually size up from the be very first consultation with someone whether they prefer the notion that all of their emotional troubles derive from some, you know, quote unquote chemical imbalance. Whether or not it's so, it's different from saying whether they prefer that to be the case. Some people really prefer that to be the case. And uh, they'll identify their troubles as deriving from this underlying biology. Again, to some degrees, it's very legitimate inference. In other cases, maybe not as much. So um, uh, the, the problem would be in the case where there's something in between where people reflect some combination of some biological instability, we'll call it, and some aspect of their, uh, the way their brains interface with their life and their experience. And we call that their psychology, right? And uh, I think, well, let's say it's a little bit of a way, some of these folks, are motivated to suppress some of the psychological uh, mm -hmm. components, the psychological inputs to their distress, um, and and I'll and I'll I'll say one other thing about this. I think for me, because I don't administer, I don't say to someone, "Here's a placebo," or I don't give out a medicine that is uh, that I know to be a placebo. But I certainly know a lot of what I provide patients is a placebo effect. I, I like to think that the 
medications I give have a particular mechanism of action and they'll come into effect and cure what I'm trying to help them with. But in many instances, I know having a positive feeling about the drug may work well, or the patient might have a miraculous recovery in sort of too short a time interval. You think, well, that's not, that can't be the pharmacological effect. So that's one yeah. thing. Yeah. yeah, you're raising different aspects related to the placebo phenomena. Uh, anyway, we like to think that placebo's component are part of any treatment, any active treatment. If you take an antidepressant together with the action of the antidepressant, there is a psychosocial component that is the shamanic component. Eventually the only patient who didn't respond was because he had the prion disease or because of some genetic asset, like uh, we will learn from Catherine that some patients do not respond to the placebo component of active treatments do not respond to placebos. So when I started to study the neurobiology of placebo, I was working with uh, Parkinson patients. Yeah. We were uh, in a very special setting, implantation of DP brain stimulation to study patients with Parkinson who do not respond to the typical cocktail of anti-Parkinson anti drugs. And the goal was to try to understand if during the surgical procedure, we can study the changes occurring at the level of neurons when a patient expects to receive dopamine. In particular, we were using apomorphine that is a dopamine agonist. So the goal was to try to understand if giving a placebo in a surgical room can produce a change at the level of neurons. And uh, in a blind counterbalance way, patients are receiving uh, a subcutaneous part of their uh, a arm, an injection of placebo. And we were recording from the other part of the setting without even seeing the time of injection, the neuronal changes occurring uh, you know, together with the injection of this uh, placebo. And uh, as a neurophysiologist, together with the surgeons and colleagues that uh, were neuro neurologists, we were recording hundreds of cells changing the spike. So when you see something changing in the brain because a patient receives an injection of a placebo, you understand the power of the mind. So there is something that is not merely, you know, philosophy or uh, a you know, something that we read in a narrative book. It's really a link between the neurobiology, our ability to change the response to a treatment, and the what we call the neurobiology of placebo effects. Importantly, we don't need necessarily a placebo to study placebo effects. Today, we know that there are many different treatment that we have been using in clinical setting to explore how this power of the mind can somehow either amplify the response to a treatment, for example, remifentanil, an opioid, or uh, another drug uh, like ketamine. And uh, we observe either an increase of the benefit, like people experience larger analgesic effects, larger antidepressant or reduction of anxiety, but some other patients respond in a paradoxical way, like Catherine may mention in, in her book, where we see a worsening of the symptoms. So then you understand that studying the placebo phenomenon can be quite complex. So we have patients that receive a placebo and they respond, they benefit. We have patients who receive an active treatment like an opioid, and they respond as if it was a super drug magic. Mm -hmm. other patients, we use the same treatment, a placebo for, you know, a pain therapeutic or antidepressant, no matter what we do, they don't respond. So that is a little bit to what make me interested in, uh, you know, leading my team at the University of Maryland in exploring uh, these phenotypes of placebo effects. So we all as clinicians, physicians, therapists, psychotherapist, we know that there is something relevant about this interaction with our patient that triggers this sort of, uh, you know, interesting phenomenon 
for which patient improve. But what what are these kind of things and why eventually they occur? And and the big question is why some patients do respond and some other patients respond minimally or not at all with a sort of reverse effects of worsening. So one just to follow up on that and for a question for you and for Catherine, uh, it seems to me that you on the one hand, it might be that there are patients who respond and patients who don't. On the other hand, I can imagine a lot of factors are involved in that. So mm-hmm. for instance, how severe the symptoms are, how much, as Gerald was saying, they think that somehow they are in control of these symptoms or they're sort of external to one, that it's not something they have control over. Yes. What's said to them about, uh, you know, what kind of expectations are set up, uh, how much of a placebo response, for how long, for which things. So is it generalizable? Are there, it seems there are patients who either do or don't respond, or I can imagine there being sort of um, a, a, a variety of phenotypes of, uh, you know, how much based on what factors, et cetera. I mean, I think it's so complicated because there's so many factors that drive placebo response. For years, we've focused on learning, conditioning, and expectation as a key drivers, and, and certainly they are. Um, but now we know several genes that uh, modify response to placebo treatment, not necessarily a placebo effect. These genes might be associated with just a natural history of the condition. So for instance, one of the genes we study um, is a gene that breaks down dopamine. Um, And so we hypothesize that people with high dopamine, um, because their enzyme that the gene codes for doesn't work as well, that the people who had more dopamine would be placebo responders. And we did indeed find that. But is that person always a placebo responder? Can I tell them that, you know, they're a placebo responder and change their placebo response? Can I tell them something not harmfully negative, but something like, oh, this doesn't work very well. And can I get from them a more powerful negative response, which we call a nocebo response? So are they just labile, um, suggestible people Or is this in the context of the condition that we studied in that case, it was IBS, that in the context of IBS, these people are a placebo responder. One question that we like to think about is, if I do a clinical trial in depression and I find this set of people with um, um, responders to placebo and depression, if I put them, and many people have comorbidities, so this is not an, an unlikely scenario, if I put them in a hypertensive trial, for an antihypertension drug, would they be placebo responders there? And so I think there's so many questions and it's such a rich and fascinating um, field that I think we're only beginning to scratch the surface. Indeed. And to stand, start to address these questions, what we are doing, uh, Catherine, myself, uh, and many other uh, in this era of research, bring these questions back to the lab. And we somehow try to study each component. So we use a script, randomize. We create the largest so far a database of patients with temporomandibular disorder funded by the National Institute of Dental Craniofacial Research. We have a data set of over 800 patients that come and came to the lab to try to understand is severity of pain related to placebo? Do sex interfere and sex and race interfere with placebo responsiveness? How long a placebo response can last? And for example, what we published recently is that uh, severity of pain, number of years of temporomandibular pain, that is a chronic disease emerging, affecting many young people and with many other pain comorbidities, IBS, low back pain, fibromyalgia, this patient responded to placebo no matter of how many years they had the TMD, mm. no matter of how severe is their pain. And sometimes the response that we see to placebo is huge, like eight out of 100 on a scale from zero to 100 for pain severity. But also we observe that sex make a difference. Women tend to be characterized by larger placebo effects. And this is another fascinating topic where the neuroscience and neurobiology of sex difference is contributing to understand why eventually women 
show larger placebo effects, which are the mechanism. And another uh, aspect that we are focusing and we publish already is racial differences make a difference again. We are in a special city, Baltimore, that allows us to study you know, a diverse population. We have uh, over 35 percentage of patients who are Afro-Americans. So we have also Asians and uh, white people. When we compare Afro-Americans with white, Again, we see that Afro-Americans have less placebo responses. We are diving into that now to try to understand. Is this related to genes? Is this related to the severity of the pain that somehow is larger than white? Is because we have less access to mm. you know, better income and uh, health care. So it is fascinating to see that we think about placebo as a difficult topic because as all this uh, complexity, but at the same time, we can study part by part the placebo responsiveness. So I would just add cultural factors also. So there's a large literature shows that people's response to pain and their expression of pain and mm -hmm. what they feel is how much you can talk about how much pain you have are shaped by culture. So for instance, there were studies that showed that this is a number of years ago, you know, Italians had lower, quote, lower pain thresholds, had given the same amount of pain to people of different ethnicities. Italians would report higher levels of pain, for instance, and some other groups and other groups less, I think Scandinavians less, et cetera. Uh, and so it, I, I think the feeling was it was more, uh, you know, not, you know, how stoical one wants to be in, or the culture encourages one to be versus how expressive or how expressive people feel they're able to be, factors Absolutely. like that. So. I haven't looked at that literature in a number of years, but I think those may be factors as well and it, it, that may play a role in some of this. Well, we had the contribution of Daniel Mormon, an anthropologist from the University of Michigan, right. who was the first one to say, hey guys, here the anthropological part, cultural part is yeah, so yeah. relevant. Yeah. European and Americans may differ in the response to uh, tablets versus injections. And that is fascinating. And uh, Again, in this large cohort of patients that uh, we are studying, and they are very kind because we invite them several times to the lab and loyal to our studies, we start to explore how a cultural background, if they were, um, you know, somehow Italians, Asians, Chinese, or Americans, how this may change placebo effects. I can't say too much because we are working and we didn't publish that but the results show that there are strong cultural components that modulate placebo effects again. Well, I was in Zurich for four years. Excuse me, Catherine. I'll just quickly yeah, yeah. add to yeah. that. Yeah. Um, and of course, in, in Switzerland, you have the French Swiss, the German Swiss, um, the Italian Swiss, and the Romanish. And in the doctors, at the, in the delivery departments, they could tell you who was from which part of Switzerland, and they were all Swiss, by the amount of expressiveness and the arias and the laments that were coming from the different rooms. So I wonder if it's really pain thresholds or really the cultural permission to, to express it and sing it all. But what's felt to be appropriate, yeah. Well, yeah. but then, there's, yeah. then also it's part of the complexity, there's that affective response, let's call it a primary response of the patient in the face of their symptom. And then that fits into the ecology of their relationship with their doctors, because their sure. affective expression influences their doctor's responsiveness and may create a certain uh, acceptance of the doctor's advice or not. You can imagine all sorts of variations. Let's bring it back to this, uh, Catherine, because for pain threshold and pain tolerance, we know that genes play a role. Afro-Americans, again, have uh, lower pain threshold, and we know that this difference is linked to several genetic variants and differences. So Certainly, and you, you do see differences in the distribution of some of those variants in um, different populations by race and ethnicity. Um, but, you know, I just was reading a, a paper. Um, uh, there are many, many studies now that are trying to predict who the placebo responder is, right? Um, the the Obviously, they want to do it because um, in clinical trials, you can um, either take out your placebo responders or analyze your data a little bit differently. 
and so many clinical trials are failing, so it's a big problem. But what's really fascinating is um, if you look across all the studies, and there have been several, um, starting with just looking at personality alone, looking in the big five um, for, you know, whether extroversion or openness or agreeableness are associated with placebo response, um, the data is all over the place. I think you could probably argue that you often see extroversion and openness as associated with placebo response, but it was clear that that was too blunt an instrument to really understand who a placebo responder was. And um, then you have the neuroimagers who did really elegant work and found, you know, either it's a, the right mid, middle frontal gyrus was associated with placebo response in, you know, in chronic knee pain. Um, but there wasn't a lot of crossover across all these different studies. And you would have thought that despite the heterogeneity in all these studies, if there was a placebo response signature that it would, you know, emerge. Um, fast forward to the last, you know, five years, machine learning has um, allowed us to put the kitchen sink in and to ask, you know, like if we combine demographic, um, uh, psychological measures, neuroimaging measures, genetics, what emerges. And what's amazing is you get different things in different conditions and different, you know, types of cohorts. I the, where the, computer, I, the computers start to have a lot of pain. Is that what you mean? Right. Yeah. <laughs> or how the but computers the, feel about it. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Headache. Yeah. But eventually, uh, this will be the direction to create consortium no. where we will have uh, Big data set in. to yeah. interrogate. Yeah. You know? yeah. I'm sorry for I, interrupting. But so what was the outcome of that? Well, the the, the one that, that blew me away was for depression, that the level of education was the only thing that robustly predicted your placebo response. And I wonder if you can guess which way it went. It um, lessened. <laughs> more educated, are larger the, placebo effects. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. In yeah. fact, in fact, the more educated you were, your placebo response was so strong that it was greater than your um, antidepressant response. Really? Oh, yeah. It's a PhD yeah. and you will be protected. This makes me, go, I want to go back to this idea about dopamine and dopamine metabolism mm -hmm. and expectation, because yeah. of course those two are often linked together, anticipation and expectation and dopamine. And I'm wondering uh, because I, I I feel strongly that those those um, mechanisms play a large role in human consciousness and maybe distinguishes humans from other uh, organisms. I'm wondering. I have to think you're going to tell me what I expect here. My expectation is there's not a great animal model for a placebo response. It's not true. I mean, ah, uh, I don't know. That's why I asked. I'm happy to hear I'm wrong. There are studies of uh, placebo in uh, rodents, and how can we create a placebo response in mice or rats or uh, other animals? Well, uh, we use conditioning. We expose animals to uh, medication that can be, for example, uh, rapid action antidepressant like ketamine. And um, we expose mice to ketamine for uh, is three weeks, two weeks apart. And uh, ketamine inducing mice uh, a reduction of anhedonia. They start to move more, they start to be more active after we induce, of course, the sense of reduction of the mood in animals. And um, when we replace ketamine together with my colleagues from psychiatry here, in the mouse model with a placebo, we observe a ketamine-like response in mice, suggesting that this opens up a new area of research where we can start doing optogenetics, molecular basis of uh, a, you know, placebo responsiveness. And when we engage more people to study animal models for placebo, I think we then can really understand more and more about this phenomenon. The beauty is that animals respond to placebo. And of course, we can't tell them this drug is powerful, you will feel less pain, just because we don't know their language. It's our limitation, not their <laughs> So, but definitely we can use learning mechanism and conditioning to create condition at the response and placebo effects. It has been also showing pain with both acute pain and uh, neuropathic pain. We had someone in my lab who recently finished her PhD who studied 
fentanyl in rats with a model of trigeminal pain, again, to explore a placebo effects in rats. So, it is and, and, and Catherine, in, in the studies that you were mentioning, do you tell the patients that they're receiving a placebo? And I'm interested in what, what the ethic is of whether you tell a patient or not. And Robert, you must have put a great deal of thought into this. So could you give us a sense of that? Yeah, there's a whole new field or I, of course, nothing's new. If you go back in the literature, you'll see it um, um, pretty early on where um, it's called open label placebo therapy, where you tell the patient that it's a placebo and um, Strikingly, and I think about 10 studies now, they're small studies, we've seen pretty impressive effects where people actually get better. But the key thing here is, think about it, right? Firstly, um, the, the assumption that if you're on the active therapy that you're going to get better is what creates the bias, is what creates the expe expectation, is what creates the placebo effect. So if you change the script, so you tell the patient what I call the truth about placebos, which is that Placebos work sometimes in 33% of people. That some people who have taken placebos have gotten better and they've gotten better for quite a long time. Let's try the placebo in you and let's see how you respond. That's a very different thing from saying, you know, I'm, I'm really sorry, but you might get randomized to drug or you might get randomized to placebo. You know, so it's creating a realistic but positive expectation about placebo can actually influence the outcome. And we've seen now in IBS, in depression, in chronic low back pain, um, yeah, in several conditions that are, you know, functional pain syndromes, um, you can see this enhanced placebo response with open label placebo. What's interesting is you don't see it in wound healing um, and you don't see it in places where you wouldn't expect to see it. You know, placebos don't work to um, fight COVID. Placebos don't work to fight cancer. I mean, they might reduce your stress um, or they might help you feel better, but they're not going to stop the, um, the cells from, from spreading. So I would say ethically, and there's a, there's a number of interesting ethical questions here that come up. So uh, a, the uh, physicians, I think, uh, should not uh, knowingly deceive patients, right? Patients right. have a right to know what they're getting, what's involved, et cetera. That being said, obviously, patients may benefit simply from, quote, the placebo effect of, you know, here's something that might help you. I think, uh, and studies have shown that about half of doctors say that they give placebos. Interestingly, uh, there are variations also by geographic region in the United States. So doctors in the South are 50% more likely to say they give placebos to their patients than doctors in the Northeast or the Midwest, et cetera. But I think what happens is my own view is that a lot of holistic medicine uh, uh, draws on the placebo effect, reflects the placebo effect. Vitamins, for instance, for the average American, I think, uh, are largely, I, I would argue, in part, the placebo effect, at least for many, many people. And Why so do you I, argue that, Robert? I, I'm just curious, and I hate to cut you off, but I really just think, I want to I wanna ask you to explain the basis of thinking that vitamins are placebos. Well, let me first finish the point, then yeah. I'll answer your question yeah. if I can. Uh, so um, the, the, my, my overall point on that is that there are over-the-counter holistic remedies that are sold that I think work, people say they work, uh, and I think a lot of that for many, many people is by placebo effect. Uh, and so I think what doctors can do ethically, and answer your question, Beverly, is rather than saying, I'm going to deceive you and give you a placebo effect and say it's a real something, I think doctors can say things like, you know, many patients benefit from over-the-counter remedies, from vitamins, et cetera. In answer to your question, Catherine, data show that the percent of people who actually have vitamin deficiencies is very, very low. So not more than a handful of percent of Americans actually have vitamin deficiencies. And so the data, as I understand it, on uh, use of many men... Now, when I, say, uh, I should say a few things. One is, they're placebos and placebos, and we mean different things by placebos, right? So that's Fair a whole enough. discussion, yeah. what we mean by placebos. Over-the-counter holistic medicine, we mean many, many things. Certainly, there are some people who have vitamin deficiencies, but the average person who takes a multivite, my understanding of the data shows that they don't have a vitamin deficiency. Uh, just if you look statistically, or certainly a huge percent of people who take a multivite, vitamin C, for instance, my understanding is the data shows that 
except for the placebo effect, vitamin C probably does not have an effect on the common cold, but mm. we like the placebo effect. Obviously, there is, you know, you know, people with anemia, et cetera, may have folate, other, you know, B12 yeah. deficiencies, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, but I think for a lot of vitamins out there, you know, vitamin C, a lot of things, and certainly, you know, if you look on their various TV shows, you know, drink raspberry juice, this is going to help cure your cancer. There's a lot of mm. over-the-counter remedies for which I think there are, uh, there is, I, I would say it's, it's basically placebo effect for people who feel that it's helpful. Obviously, you know, St. John's wort there, you know, acupuncture, I think there's studies that show that it may have some effectiveness, et cetera. But I think there's a lot mm -hmm. of holistic treatments out there that uh, um, where the placebo effect is, is what's going on. And I think that those are things that a lot of doctors can have their patients take uh, that, or encourage that might be helpful, for instance, where it's not the and something we are talking about two separate aspects. About ten years ago, we all realized that many physicians prescribe vitamins, antibiotics, and antidepressants, and this is documented in the literature as a tool to evoke placebo responses. And this is, you know, from a professional and ethical point of view, of course, uh, um, not uh, right. So we realize that many treatments are merely suggested or prescribed to make to please a patient or to make patient respond because of the power of placebo effects. On the other hand, we are talking about open label placebo, that is a sort of uh, new trend, I would say, where patients are, uh, a, you know, deliberately inform you are receiving placebo, they receive a bottle with uh, a label placebo and they are told many patients respond to placebo, you can try to use placebo. And the reason why we started this line of research with the CAPTCHUF and many other people, although it was initiated in 1963 by Parsky and other people at Johns Hopkins, was to challenge the idea that we need deceptive framework, deception to induce a placebo response. In a sort of, uh, you know, challenging way, as a scientist, we were sitting, uh, you know, around the table and say, what if we tell patient that is a placebo and we tell them, please take placebo for two months. There is no deception. There are not ethical problems because we are not giving going to an antibiotics, vitamin in place of, uh, you know, to elicit a placebo response. The only was to try to understand if pain, depression, rhinitis, ADHD, low back pain can improve when patients are told mm -hmm. you are taking a placebo. Yeah. I would say, I would say a question if I may. Yeah. Uh, uh, and that's specific, uh, connected to what Luana said, but more with what Catherine said. Are you saying that the etiology of the disease has something to do with whether there is a placebo response or not. In Absolutely. other words, you said for COVID or for cancer, there will be very unlikely a placebo response. Whereas for depression, for example, and you said IBS also, there will be. Yes. I think do we have, you want to distinguish between a placebo response and a placebo, the effect of the having a placebo response. So you can't necessarily control the response a patient will have. The question is whether or not that response will be effective to minimize or treat the disease that you have. So from what we know, um, placebos can, you know, dial down the areas of your brain that are activated in pain, for instance, and dial up the areas um, that are associated with expectation that can kind of um, uh, downward regulate the pain coming up and basically tell you you're feeling less pain. So that I mean, I think a lot of what we're learning about placebos um, are is very focused in the in the brain. Number one, and number two, um, along the lines of what um, Moana just said, with um, conditioning, you can condition ketamine. You can immunosuppress, condition people to be immunosuppressed. You can condition them um, to have several biological functions that you wouldn't think of are related to the to the brain. Um, so in, in that way, you could modify disease with conditioning and placebo, but for the large part, we don't really think that a placebo response, what, whether it's autonomic, whether it's immunologic, whether it's endocrine, or whether it's, you know, in the brain is going to stop a virus 
from you know replicating in your body and 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 doing what viruses do. So I think from that perspective, we don't think that placebos are effective treatments. And we certainly saw in what we what transpired in the last year and a half that no matter how much we wanted some you know drugs, no matter how much we believed say that chloroquine might be effective an effective treatment for for clonidine, you, you know people with high expectation might have thought like that would drive the effect of of chloroquine, but it, you know, it just couldn't um, fight the effect of the, the virus. And I would say too, I think that those conditions, conditions in which, for instance, stress uh, or pain, or it might be seen as sort of somewhat more subjective symptoms uh, are involved, I think may have more placebo response also. But that yeah. extends to, I would argue, even things like cancer, for instance, uh, placebos could have an effect, I think, because we know that you know, anxiety and depression, right, which are affected right. by placebos, can in fact also exacerbate, uh, you know, harm one's immune system, impair one's immune system, and exacerbate things like cancer. So it may be that there are even, you know, quote, more medical diseases may also be affected through those kinds of mechanisms. I, I this is think a fascinating aspect. If we uh, think about awareness of symptoms, so if we think about pain, unless you have a genetic disease for which you can't experience pain, you know what pain can be, or good mood, or uh, allergic reaction, or itching, or fatigue from a cancer. Yeah any symptom that we can perceive consciously and we have awareness of, we can modify with verbal suggestions and expectations. But if I tell you, your cortisol is going to increase, you don't know what is cortisol increase. Or if I tell you, your interleukin-6 is increasing and you have inflammation, what IL-6 increase means to us. So we can't change things that we can't access consciously, with verbal suggestion, with the power of our beliefs. But if we do a conditioning, like the mouse model that I mentioned before, we can change the release of IL-6 interferon and many other substances in the body. Right. I was about to say that, that the, the um, it, it seems to me that the nervous system on the one hand, and then the, the uh, immune system on the other, which are both very complex, probably the two most complex components of our, our biologies are the sorts of areas where placebo effects can um, make a difference. And it's interesting that they do process more, let's say, than maybe the lining of your stomach might, let's say they do process. I mean, of course, the lining of your stomach also processes information in some sense, but you know, not in a way that I think uh, information in the immune system does. Speaking of the stomach, uh, and uh, interleukins, uh, there was a really fascinating article out of Nature about two weeks ago talking about IBS and this problem of the patient who develops a lot of pain after almost every meal. And uh, it's interesting because I think it ties into a lot of both nocebo and placebo issues, and namely a lot of these folks who suffer from chronic pain from meals go through the trouble of trying to isolate what it is in their diet that might be causing the problem. They'll remove gluten or they'll remove meats or they'll remove, you know, and a lot of these folks end up, and this is the article reflected this, some of them end up chasing their tail because they just simply don't seem to be able to identify what it is that's causing their trouble. You know, they'll rotate diets and so forth very carefully and come up with nothing. And in this study, with which, which was in, in rats, they found a mast cell release uh, that mm. was unique in the in the rats who had their that model of sort of postprandial after meal pain disorders. And so then along with that, the release of these interleukin, the, in, the inflammatory cytokines, and uh, they found that blocking that effect reduced it. And so, but what, what happened in the fact is that speaking of the stomach having its own information processing, that somehow the release of the mast cells was in response to, it, it, it was tagged almost any meal they happened to just have. So it's almost like the mast cell started to associate itself with with the meal of the day, let's say, and right. created created a response that they could they could block with the appropriate agents. Very this is interesting because it could have to... been a no sorry a nocebic conditioning. Kind of going back to what um, Luana was saying, you could imagine that um, there could have been an incidental um, coupling between something somebody ate and pain 
something right. somebody in, ate in pain, and now you get this generalized effect. And so it's almost as if, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy or some other, you know, non-chemical intervention is yeah. what is, is called for. Well, I wanted to ask one more thing about if I understand correctly, in the classical placebo experiment, the classical way placebo is used, the person doesn't know that they're, he or she is taking placebo. In the open label, they know they're taking placebo. The second one becomes very close to suggestion and becomes close to, you know, what we used to do in the old days, hypnotic suggestion and just suggestion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Whereas the first one, the person is not really getting any suggestion of any kind. They think they're just taking the medication unless they consider the medication itself a suggestion. So I wondered what the thought is about that. Well, I think the first case also has suggestion. If I say right. this is a medication I'm going to give you for your fill in the blank depression or Parkinson's or something else, you're thinking it's going to help me. And ethically, there is, there is a literature about a concept called therapeutic misconception, which is it turns out that uh, even when, uh, when in research, we tell people, look, you may be on placebo, uh, a coin is flipped, you know, or whatever. Uh, when you ask people, how is it that it was decided that you're going to get this drug that you're now getting, this, this what pill you're taking, they'll say, well, the doctor decided that's what's best for me. So I think for most people, when they see someone in a white coat in a hospital, give them something, even if they know it's 50% chance it's placebo, they will think it's being chosen uh, to make themselves better. So I think those kinds of expectations uh, get set. Absolutely. Are different kinds of expectations. I mean, in the context of randomized clinical trials, we know that we introduce this concept of therapeutic misconception to account for the desire to get better, the desire to contribute to advanced science. And um, the open label placebo is something intriguing because we tell patient it's a placebo. And we think that merely taking a pill it may contribute to a sort of condition and the response where patient, although they don't have specific beliefs, or oh, I may get 50% of chance that I am in the active arm for this trial, you know, we set the expectation to zero percentage of getting an active drug. You just receive a placebo. And probably the action of taking a pill may trigger a condition at the response. Again, because we know what is the action of uh, a pain therapeutic and uh, subconsciously, but I'm very careful in using this term, we may trigger body responses that we learn through our life. I bet if we provide the open placebo to children that didn't have yet the experience of being treated, it may have a different meaning unless we say mm -hmm. last sadness, you know? Mm -hmm. So again, uh, there is the complexity of uh, our cognitive functions in interacting with our body response and this connection, you know, at the level of uh, autonomic system, brain system and immune system that can help to understand the variety of placebo effects. Although I would just... I would just add to that quickly that I think some of it may also be due to the ecology, people of feeling helpless and going to a doctor's office, even if they're told this is a placebo, you know, I went and saw the doctor, he said, I'm not dying of cancer, you know, he seemed or she seemed hopeful. I think those kind of interactions may be part of why an open label placebo may work is, uh, you know, the doctor listened okay. to me. There was a connection, he likes me or she likes me, is a relationship. I mean, I think those elements perhaps might play a role. I also yeah, wonder you about- can see that in, um, sorry, quickly, in, um, in, in, in Ted Catrix, in, in both of the recent studies, or not one is not so recent on IBS, where um, people on the wait list, so you're not getting any placebo at all, um, had a 30% improvement um, compared to people who got sham acupuncture, who had like a you know forty percent improvement, and people who got the sham acupuncture because the, plus the warm, caring interaction got sixty-two percent of them had had an improvement. So just you know signing up to to be asked questions and given and give blood um, can be very therapeutic. Um, I, I know that 
sorry. Yeah, Greg Katzen, just one last up. thing. Yeah. Um, I I wanted to um, experience being in a clinical trial as a as a um, a patient myself. So. I signed up for a trial for insomnia and I was so excited about it. I was driving to work and I thought, well, when I get more sleep, I'm going to call my brother more. I'm going to call my sister more. I'm going to be such, I'm going to be such a better person. And I'm thinking all this. And then I'm like driving, you know, I'm in traffic and I said, wow, I could, I'm just going to call my brother right now. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's great. That's so great. I called him and he was like, why are you calling me? I'm, I'm, I'm like, Oh, wow. I haven't even gotten in the trial yet. And already I'm dealt with my insomnia. And ironically, I never got in the trial because I, I was, you know, I, I had I met, I had too many exclusion criteria. But um, you got cured anyway. Tell us, please, actually, you're sleeping actually, better. I'm sleeping much better. Uh, it's crazy. <laughs> I, you know, the, what you started to say, Catherine, was a great segue when you jumped in just a second ahead of me. But I was thinking about something I think is related. <clears throat> this is when you mentioned that uh, people in the wait list do better, 30% like th of them do better. What I find in my practice, because I see a lot of treatment refractory patients, they've been on a gazillion antidepressants typically, mm. and sometimes other meds, but they've been on a gazillion antidepressants, one after the other after the other. And they come to me and they're a wreck. And um, I typically try to, in a careful way, do a little bit of a washout, you know, take them off the meds the, as best I can. And that often really helps a lot. Not always. Sometimes you have to build it back up. But my point is that I think some holistic treatments, and I wonder whether this actually occurs even in some placebo, uh, the, the placebo arm of some studies, you know, just removing people from treatments that may have been having pernicious effects, because people, a lot of them are, they're, they're looking for research help because they're, they're refractory, right? So I wonder in how many cases you've removed this. I know firsthand a case that I saw of a woman with very severe depression, like I just described on lots of antidepressants for a couple of years, just doing miserably. And she went away to some sort of holistic spa-like place and they withdrew her from her meds and she did really nicely. And she yeah. thought it was all of the treatments they had provided to her, including a lot of holistic treatments and such. And that may be that they helped. I'm, I'm not that much of a skeptic about it, but I formed the idea that had to do with withdrawing her from the medicines. Sure enough, she had a recurrence of her depression and she went back and she didn't do very well this time. She went back taking no meds and arrived in a depressed state. And she came to me and I said, look, I think what happened was you got better largely because you weren't taking treatment and they rid, rid you of all those negative effects. And now you've had a recurrence and we have to you know, get to work on it in a, in a, in a more active way. And it, and it worked, it ended up working. But so I'm wondering how much removing those, you know, pain medicines, for example, when they don't work, especially for chronic pain, and they typically don't very well, they cause a wide range of horrible side effects that that really reduce a person's quality of life. So I wondered about that. I was going to ask, by the way, Catherine, Catherine, your book, the pain, the, the placebo paradox, Luana said, I can imagine several paradoxes we've been talking about. Uh, one is the, but Luana mentioned one early on in her initial remarks about that some people placebo actually hurts them or something. But is that was I was wondering what is what is the paradox? Is that the paradox you're focusing on, or others, or all of these? There's so many. I, it, what's the plural, Beverly? You might know the plural of paradox. Is it paradox? Paradoxes. Um, paradoxes. Paradoxes. Yeah. 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 Um, there's so many. For instance, there is actually a thing called the the um, the placebo. I think it's actually the um, the the placebo paradox, where people like if you do the math on the difference between drug and placebo, um, it, it 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 it's supposed to be additive. Drugs and placebos are supposed to be additive, but um, several people who don't respond to um, psychiatric meds um and who do respond to placebo basically mess up that math and so there's a like a formal term called placebo paradox but i think the paradox there's so many paradoxes there is this paradox um of people who don't respond when we think they should respond there's the paradox of it should be additive um and and i apologize for jumping on you with the vitamins but that's kind of my um I'm passionate about vitamins and it's interesting. I want to say why, because I think of vitamins as drugs. Vitamins are drugs that we were unable to demonstrate that they were better than placebo in clinical trials. Um, but there's so many um, natural substances that when we um, purify them, like, you know, 
willow bark from the the tree the um the uh, from bark from a willow tree is where we get aspirin for instance statins are extracted from the mold uh, like the green mold on your bread um is is where we get statins so there's so many of these natural products that are actually drugs when we purify them um and then we can demonstrate or actually a lot of them are grandfathered in but when you really try and test you know, vitamin E, vitamin, maybe not so much vitamin B, vitamin C, we can't see a difference between drug and placebo. But my work has shown that genetically, there are subsets of people who respond to vitamin E, for instance, um, and another subset that are harmed, or I should say do worse with vitamin E. And then this subset that responds to vitamin E does worse on placebo. And the subset that responds to that does worse on vitamin E um, uh, does worse on drugs. So basically, the, um, placebo. Basically, they cancel each other out. Is what I'm saying. And so you never see this difference um, between these vitamins and these drugs. And I would argue that there's so many drugs now that if we took them back through a modern day placebo trial, they would probably fail. Um, and so. You know, I think that this is this is an inherent paradox in how we understand and how we project onto what we think is real medicine and what is actually, um, you know, holistic um, or is a vitamin um, or what we see as effective. I think there there are paradoxes everywhere. Um, if if I can just yeah. respond to that, great point. Sure. Thank you. So. Yeah. Um, so clearly there are strong pharmacological properties in many natural substances, right? So, you know, lithium's a salt. And as you mentioned, you know, there's poisonous plants out there too and, and beneficial plants, et cetera. Um, that being said, you know, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the holistic medicine industry is a multi-billion dollar industry in this country. I don't know if it's 10 or $20 billion. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I think that for... Most people, and you see, you know, natural vitamin stores, et cetera, et cetera. I think for, certainly for a lot, I would hypothesize for most, but not for all patients who go in there, what they're coming out with is going to be more placebo effect, or I would hypothesize it'd be a lot of placebo effect, not from whatever they're buying in the GMC vitamin store, the natural, you know, uh, holistic medicine store that, that actually it's a physiological effect. But I think the work you're doing it's to, to tease these out is extremely important and right. look forward to seeing the results. Um, I wanted to ask also your opinion about the a specifically timely thing, which is over my practice for the last couple of months, the major thing that people talk about in relation to their bodies is the effect of the vaccine on their bodies. Some have absolutely no side effects. Some have very violent side effects. Do you think there is an expectation factor in that? Or do you think it's an immune system issue? Well, Catherine, they, they, may not be, they, they may not be separate, though, remember. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. And, uh, we, Luana, you you're working on this, right? So you might have yes, a intimate on, uh, uh, yeah, our yeah. expectation and the side effects to the vaccine. Uh, and also people who may not want the vaccine. There is the huge case in uh, Europe of AstraZeneca just now. So uh, mm, definitely the immune response and the way we respond to the same trigger, in particular the vaccine, justify different experience of side effects. Some people may be extremely fearful, anxious, and this can uh, amplify the perception of side effects. But also some people may have the COVID and they may have an amplified the response to the vaccine because there is a memory, immunological memory to, uh, you know, the SARS-CoV-2. So mm -hmm. it is quite complex, but definitely we need to, uh, you know, be conscious to say, well, uh, this is just in your mind. No, many people are experiencing severe side effects for uh, this kind of vaccine. And, uh, you know, the difference in uh, immune system genetics and uh, prior exposure to the virus through the disease justify a different amount of side effects. Yeah, there's also a, a very um, complex um, statin 
related nocebo effect that's happening in popular culture right now. There's a belief certainly out there that statins cause um, muscle pain and, and several other side effects. And unfortunately, um, I think that the, the press certainly has picked this up, but also um, there, there are what, what, what are called statin denialists. Um, and if you Google statin side effects, you get 10 million hits, 10 million hits. Now, there more recently, people have done, researchers have done clinical trials where people who could never take a statin, they took a statin in three weeks, they had to come off of it because they had such terrible pain. They've randomized them so they're blinded. They don't know they're taking a statin. Um, and they've actually, there's a, a type of trial design called an N of one trial where you kind of, uh, you spend a month on a statin, you spend a month on a placebo and a month of no pills, but you don't know what order you're getting or what you're getting. Obviously, you know when you're, when you're taking no pills, but you don't know when you're taking a statin and when you're taking a placebo. And what they found was half of the people who went to the end of the study um, were able to t go back to taking a statin. Um, and when they looked at the distribution of side effects, there was no difference between when people had negative side effects with placebo versus when they had with them with statins. So there's obviously, you know, there are people who have muscle pain with, with statins, there's no question, but there are a lot of people who have probably side effects that are more nocebos and are induced by expectation. And it's so hard to control Back in the day, you could kind of say, you, the physician, could tell the patient what to expect. But now the World Wide Web tells us what to expect. And, you know, it really depends what rabbit hole you go down. And Lord knows when you go down one of these rabbit holes, you get more and more. You know, the holes kind of proliferate and you, you get further down and you get stuck. And I think this is a tremendous um, harm to so many people and very unfortunate. No, I hope something, some uh, pain, you know, some people who experience pain stop to move, stop to exercise, stop to have a, yep. a social life. And uh, this mechanism of fear and anxiety becomes so dangerous. And the same can be probably applied to the statin model and nocebo responses where people respond with uh, terrible muscle pain and again pain and uh, stop to take statins without considering that they expose themselves to the risk of heart attack and strokes. So yes, definitely nocebo experience of, uh, you know, side effects like pain and anxiety can become uh, a sort of a trigger to more negative expectation and nocebo effects. I, I was hoping, I, I would like to say this one thing because I think it's implied by almost everything that we've said today, but I think it bears emphasis. I mean, I know, again, as a clinician, when I hear, and I hear a lot of complaints about a lot of symptoms, and some of them even seem a little bit hard for me to account for, but I, oh, I, I never think of it as being like, quote unquote, in someone's mind. I always think there's some mechanism that's a physical mechanism that's accounting for this, whether or not it's based on their body's reaction to expectation or to some, in, some incidental property of the drug that triggers a nocebo effect, for example, I'm, I never think this is some sort of mentalistic, something in some mental realm alone. I think of it as being something that's triggered. And I, it's important to try to figure out why. why. Why is this happening to this person? So The important thing is that when we observe this negative behaviors, negative expectation, negative outcomes, it is much more difficult to erase and remove this kind of... Uh, responses than a placebo response, positive outcome. Mm -hmm. And we study in the lab why this happened, which part of the brain is involved. So probably from an evolutionary point of view, we as human begin tend to respond in a more aggressive way to negative uh, events. And this somehow help us to prevent uh, you know, dangerous uh, situations. But when this become chronic, of course it become uh, part of the disease that we have difficulty to handle, at least from a symptomatological point of view. Yeah, um, the, the, there's a large literature on that, of course, on sort of, uh, you know, Daniel Kahneman, uh, you know, won the Nobel Prize for discussing sort of, yes. uh, you know, biases one may have. Uh, I just want to mention two things, just I, first of all, I also see there's a few questions coming from the audience we may want to answer a bit. Um, 
But, but one thing, I just wanted to come back to the notion, uh, something Catherine said earlier about RCTs and uh, the interest ethically to sort of not have people respond to placebo, however, placebo mm -hmm. responders in clinical trials. I think that raises some ethical concerns. Uh, so the re I, I think what you mentioned is, and I think you're speaking about other drug companies out there that are doing this. Uh, there's a concern, you know, a lot of RCTs aren't working, as you're saying. I would contend a lot of RCTs aren't working now, but more did in the past, not because there's more placebo response in the world now, that's not what you were suggesting, I know, but because there aren't as good drugs, perhaps, right? And mm. so uh, well, the problem no, with no, no, no. eliminating, if I can just finish for a second, the problem with eliminating placebo responses in the study is mm. that in the world, when the drug is then approved, there are in fact placebo responders. So you do yeah. in fact want to know how good a drug is, if I say this is my new drug against placebo, because in the world, that's what's going to happen out there. So I just think that raises a few questions in my mind, just to put it out there. Um, this, I think this has a bearing, it's not straight on subject, but there was just a report from Cambridge University study mm -hmm. that LSD microdosing is thought to have a large placebo effect. Do you have any opinion or knowledge about this? And, and like I after you're smiling. I think after that, we should go to the audience. Yes, we will. Yeah. Yeah. Briefly, um, in the literature, there is evidence that placebo responses in randomized clinical trials are larger compared to what we observe uh, 15, 20, 25 years ago. And one of the reasons is our marketing. We invest much more in marketing. We are good in, uh, you know, in social media, in uh, coloring uh, our drugs. So I would be still optimistic on the drug development. We do develop new drugs. We do well as uh, physicians and scientists. The problem of placebo response is becoming larger and larger. It's also because we do better with engaging in this therapeutic doctor-patient relationship. And another thing that we don't do so well yet, bring in the mechanism and the knowledge of placebo effects into the randomized clinical trial methodology. Why do we use still as gold standard the additive model that Catherine mentioned a little ago? We have better tools, we have better designs. And from Harvard, we have colleagues like Pav and some other people who suggest let's change the design of clinical trials. The comparison between a placebo versus active drug cannot be enough, cannot be just uh, you know the solution to say this drug works or not. So we need to think uh, in a more uh, creative and you know, smart way how we design a clinical trial for this disease, because if we study the immune system, it's different than studying schizophrenia. So and we still apply the same clinical trial design to any disease, no matter which is the etiology. So what we should do well, we we should go ahead, but I Yeah, I just wanna say I can talk about pain, that is my area of interest. I mean, we know that there is a huge influence of expectations and still we don't measure expectation when we do clinical trial. We know that sex, race influence, the therapist race and sex or trialist make an if an if difference. We know that genetic assets change. So if we know all these things, why want to we start with a collection of uh, saliva for DNA with, uh, you know, powerful assessment of uh, social demographic prior experience of uh, unsuccessful uh, pain therapeutics and do a better job in design a clinical trial and account for all the variables that at least we know. We don't know that yet. Yeah, I think it's, I mean, going back to the ethics and also um, to build on Moana, it, it's a very complex and troubling problem. I think that we are stuck on the double blind randomized placebo control trial, and we do need to rethink it. But in looking at what people have proposed, even FAVA's um, new methodology has hit um, problems um, with um, demonstrating efficacy being more effective than the, the, the typical randomized clinical trial. So it's not a simple problem to solve. And I do think the ethics that, that Robert kind of raised is super important because think about it. What are we going to give the placebo responders? Are we not going to give them drugs? Are we going to say like, are we going to give them placebos? And I think this is mostly um, 
disconcerting and troubling, for instance, in the area of surgery. Recently, there have been a number of clinical trials in surgery where they've actually, usually surgery, surgeons for, for, I mean, I don't even know how long, you know, decades, um, scores of decades have been, um, they, they haven't had to do randomized trials. Um, but now, you know, whether it's, it's vertebroplasty or renal denervation or, um, you know, or, or th- uh, arthroscopic surgery, like all these are having problems demonstrating efficacy beyond placebo. But here's the problem. And if we, we say, yeah, if we say that that this procedure that we've been doing for, you know, decades does not be placebo, so we're not going to do it. Are we going to give people a sham surgery? I mean, I don't think it's it's such a complex problem. I think that we really need to think through the whole thing from whether or not we're ready to the trial to what happens. Including the ethics. Yeah. We're going to the it's ethical not, consideration yeah. of uh, ethics of a surgical uh, procedure and clinical trial with sham surgery, ethics of open label placebo, ethics of randomized clinical trials. I would yeah. just say there, the problem with sham surgery, especially people put under anesthesia in it, general anesthesia, is there's risk. Yeah. So ideally, just to put it out there to brainstorm, if there's some way to give a placebo that had no risk, and so obviously there are some things to decide, are there placebo responders who've just responded to surgery because it, of the placebo effect, in which case could there be something that's but, risk-free, et cetera, just as a thought. Let's try something more simple. So, Why don't we explain patient? There is no evidence that this treatment is better than sham. Do you still want to go through the sham or do you want to go to Edward and mm-hmm. he will explain you more about the placebo effect? That's well, a great I, moment. I, I, I just want to say one thing. I'm, I'm a, I recently had rotator cuff surgery and that was a, one of the surgeries that they had this you know, big uproar about. It was the most painful experience I've ever had and I would probably pick the surgery. And that's surprising to me, but it's true. <laughs> the reward of pain. <laughs> I no, I think so, it's just. I think my shoulder works really well now, and you know, I think somehow I, that I'm, I'm, I I don't know if I could have gotten there with physical therapy because I don't know if I have I would have had the discipline without the surgery to do the physical therapy. But you know, we're all complex beings. Yep. And on that note, I want to thank you for your incredible exchange here and let the audience in. There have been several questions that have come up. And Alex, will you uh, moderate that part? Um, Yeah. Okay. So uh, first question is from Dr. Diane Gartland. Thank you, Diane. Uh, So she was wanted to why don't you guys reflect on the popularity of hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin in treatment of COVID despite lack of scientific uh, evidence? I know you brushed on it slightly. So if there's anything more you would want to add on to that topic. I would just say that when people feel helpless, they grasp at straws and want something that's going to make them feel better. People don't like the sense of being helpless, being depressed, despair, et cetera. And so people will gravitates to something, one. And secondly, what we haven't talked about is, we touched on a little bit, is how politics and political biases affect perceptions of these issues, which I think is a factor. Absolutely. And initially, the drug was introduced anecdotally without having run clinical trials. So somehow we uh, randomized people to the active drug and placebo to come to the evidence that there was no indication for this treatment. The COVID-19 pandemic was a very difficult situation to handle and, uh, you know, there was an attempt to try different therapeutic solutions. Now, today, we have better answers after one year and the therapeutic protocols for COVID-19 have changed as a result of clinical trials with a placebo arm. I think yeah. there's also there's also a, a a a pernicious sort of anti-medicine narrative out there that goes something like this: doctors don't really want to look at certain evidence because that's not the way they're trained, and they are uh, biased against certain approaches. That's sort of a little bit of this. That storyline came a little bit into our previous president's narrative about hydrochloroquine. You know that doctors didn't really. You know, weren't taking these anecdotal reports seriously and sure they sure should. Why are they being so um, pig-headed about it? 
that was the sort of part of the narrative. I would say that reporters uh, in situation like this have also a responsibility to educate lay yep. language yeah. people, you know, to remember the basis and solid knowledge instead of uh, uh, models and um, uh, somehow media spread example that can convey false information. Okay, can I go on to the next one? Yep. Okay. Um, so uh, this is a question I have to formulate for this commenter on YouTube, and I'm only speaking with this um, level of disrespect towards him because he showed no respect to any of you. And so I think he brings up some points, but I just want to point out that to listen to this for an hour or so and to then come to the conclusion that none of the people here know what they're talking about and that they have no model that satisfies you, I think is... Um, I think shows more about you. This is, you're a professional medical, you know, you're a medical professional, Dr. Kenneth Garcia. I did more work looking into you than you've done into any of these people. And so I'm going to form this question for you because you seem unwilling or unable to do this. And I think also to use buzzwords in either no context or even with the context you provide that shows that your model is just as simple or even stupid. I think, um, I, I, I'm only saying this because of what he wrote. And I think it's, it, you're a grown person. And you, to write a question out without resorting to these insults. And so okay. that being said, um, we'll move on. Well, I, well, look, let's just try to bring in some of the concepts he brought up because maybe you can reflect on it in a way that with the proper context. So he was curious about the effects of complex social theory on the placebo effect. And then he talked about CNS hierarchy, central nervous system hierarchy, and nonlinear processing and with regards to effects in placebo. So do you guys have any comments to give there so you could satiate his obviously complex model that exceeds our human experience? You know, go ahead. <laughs> complex social theory. Yeah, Luana, do you want to talk about, I mean, I think there are very, there are some very sophisticated models that are emerging and are very interesting. Um, one of them is the Bayesian brain or, um, predictive error processing. And um, uh, some of this work um, is basically building on um, work that's being done in neurobiology, not only in placebo research, um, that is about our brain tending to predict before, um, predict what it's going to see or experience, um, and then taking the information from the experience and basically integrating or averaging that um, information to create the experience that we actually experience. Um, and so some of this uh, predictive, uh, the Bayesian brain theories have been applied to placebos, um, in particular, for instance, into open to open label placebo to say that um, that, you know, we have a, a preconceived notion of what to expect when we get a pill, um, the new information that's coming in to say like, this pill is a placebo, but you might want to try it. And then there's this kind of synthesis of these two in which the person might re reinterpret an experience of feeling better because, you know, our symptoms are going, are basically fluctuating over time. So for instance, if in a moment that I take the pill, I'm like, oh, I'm actually feeling better then I might revise my prior um, and have a new hypothesis of how I'm feeling. And that might get revised continually to the point where I'm having a quote unquote placebo response that's ameliorative or, or positive. And Luana is a much more of a neurobiologist than me and, and might want to comment on this, you know, these theories that are in the field now. Again, I like to refer to animal models. The reason why we can study uh, placebo responses in animals is because we somehow can uh, simplify the placebo effect to a prediction of future events. So if we are receiving a treatment and we try, we, I mean, in this case, our brain as a great machine to make predictions, we may predict based on our experience, like this um, person uh, is offensive because doesn't know this topic to the extent that we know we are predicting a behavior or we can predict a, a reduction of the pain if we experience positive analgesic effects in our life. So it is complex when we apply vision modeling 
in general to symptoms, but there is an effort by different labs to uh, use um, the prior experience, current experience and expectation to predict placebo effects. And the different kinds of modeling, not just the patient, can be used to uh, anticipate if a person eventually, based on different elements that I mentioned, can be a placebo responder or not. To uh, amplify a little bit on what Luana and Catherine just said, in terms of uh, in terms of the brain's organization or reorganization, this actually dovetails a little bit into Beverly's question that none of us took a whack at yet. I'm ready to We're talking about LSD microdosing, but um, there's this notion that the brain, of course, and this again follows up on Catherine's comment. There, it has a sort self organization. It has a property of reorganizing itself. Um, in the old days, I think this was what motivated, in my mind anyway, remi- uh, motivated the early, uh, late uh, 19th century uh, German Gestalt psychology research, where the brain tended to create holes, you know, hold, holes, um, that the brain and our bodies do create these sort of self organized states. And uh, the Bayesian model says, okay, right, it, through a, a series of iterations, our brains reorganize and occasionally it might incorporate a, a medication that pushes the, the, the biology of the brain in that direction. It might involve thinking and expectation that does that. The idea behind uh, psilocybin LSD treatment is that uh, it, when it it is supposed to work in as much as it helps to reorganize the way the brain has sort of wrapped itself around the world, around reality, and by giving it a shake and sort of a reboot your brain can reorganize and you can be happy and not want to use drugs anymore or not have other sorts of um, uh, psychological symptoms. Uh, The study out of, it was the Imperial College of London found that in the microdosing uh, of, uh, in a meta-analysis, the microdosing of LSD uh, seemed to be uh, pretty much matched with the placebo response in the same studies, but uh, it remains to be seen. Of course, the dosing could be changed it might need, maybe it shouldn't be microdosing. Uh, I, I'm a little bit of a skeptic of it, but I think it's an interesting a theory that does touch on this notion of the reorganization of the brain. Hmm? Okay, uh, and I, uh, apologies, I meant to say complex systems theory anyway, but I only did this because I gave him a chance and I thought it would still try to get to these topics because I think they could add something. Um, but anyway, uh, so the next question is from Dr. Ralph Wharton. Thank you, Ralph. And they were curious about um, the con- like uh, hypnosis. So you know about they they quote that thirty percent of all patients are easily hypnotizable. So how do you think hypnotism and placebo relate to one another? I think. There are studies comparing uh, the brain imaging uh, responses to. Mm, hypnosis and placebo, and it looks like the two work through different mechanisms. Uh, again, when we explore the brain responses, we may see different mechanisms for things that from a, a symptomatological or behavioral point of view uh, looks like something similar. So hypnosis is strongly related to the suggestibility, how much people can be suggestible. And there are studies that somehow show that placebo responder tended to be also more suggestible. However, when we look at the brain, how things can change under, you know, hypnosis versus uh, placebo responses, the two seems to work through different mechanisms, at least when we talk about pain. Uh, Dr. Wharton will be a discussant in our stress roundtable in April. Mm. So thank you for the question. Um, so can I go on to the next one? Mm-hmm. So this is sort of two birds with one stone because uh, Sharon Gold and Jocelyn Diaz asked questions in a similar vein, but I think put them together, they could be quite interesting. So Sharon asks, is religion slash belief that God will make it, it being you know, fill in the blank uh, better? the ultimate placebo. And then Jocelyn, in a similar vein, asks, do you believe that spirituality plays a part in one's illness and cure? And that do you believe that one can receive miraculous cures through dreams? 
So I think there's a few questions there. So I think there's mm -hmm. no doubt that um, the data shows that, uh, quote, religiosity, that uh, spirituality can uh, help reduce stress and can assist coping uh, with many conditions. And there's been some data, and my colleagues on the call uh, may know it better than I do, uh, that it can help with uh, um, healing, et cetera. Um, I think one difference is that for many people, religion and spirituality involve social supports also. So people will, uh, if, if traditionally people go to a church or a temple, there are other people. And that's, I think some of that may work by having social support, people who care for you, knowing that people care for you, et cetera. Uh, so uh, those are some initial thoughts. There's also Myrna Weissman's group at, Yale, I, 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 not, was it Yale, now she's at Columbia for a number of years, um, shows that there's actually differences in the, 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 um, the cortex among people in uh, resiliency to depression. Uh, those who are, uh, uh, quote, have some religiosity, it could just be spirituality without religion per se, uh, that there's actually differences in the cortex associated with that that may be involved. Mm -hmm. Somehow we can compare, again, sorry for my uh, approach that is very, you know, bio, neurobiological based. If we exercise, eventually we have uh, the ability to increase structure, the area, for example, related to the hippocampus. If we meditate, we also do an exercise of our mind and something in the brain changes as a matter of doing this daily exercise. Spirituality, is somehow different than placebo effects. We are talking about two different things. Placebo effects is somehow our expectation about um, receiving a treatment and perceiving uh, an outcome improvement. Spirituality is more related to our beliefs or faith. How much you believe in something that is independent than the process that we would describe as placebo effects today. I think one thing this spirituality does is it gives people a sense of meaning and hope also. So I think the notion of hope may be a common denominator potentially. And it also addresses the emotions with music and ritual and sort of costume and celebration. So th that, that, you know, stimulates some kind of sense of ha really having experience which is what many people mean when they say something meaningful. Am I really having an experience? I do think that there are ritualistic elements of, you know, the clinical encounter. The, the physician is wearing a white coat. Um, they're, they're wearing a, you know, might have a stethoscope. They do, you know, they, there's, you know, there's the opening line. How are you doing? What brings you here today? There's a very um, ritualized um, aspect to it. So um, I haven't studied this, Luana, so I don't know, like, you know, your brain on spirituality versus your brain on placebo, what the differences are. But I do think that there are, you know, even the, the, the kind of the host in, in communion, you know, is this kind of disc that you get handed and you put on your tongue. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of, 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 of the format of a religious experience that I think is kind of replicated in, in a clinical setting. And I don't think this is unusual. I mean, you know, our brains are economical organs and it's not making a new pathway for every single different experience. It's kind of funneling experiences generally into, into these set pathways. So um, I wouldn't be surprised if there's more, you know, overlap, um, but obviously very difficult to study in the kind of acute setting that we study um, placebos in. Thank you. Um, how many more questions are we feeling? Um, I think we should go another five minutes, if that's all right with okay, you all. So I'll yeah, so there's because there's, there's one more question from someone who hasn't asked yet, and then the rest are sort of second questions. So I'll at least do that, and we'll see where we are um, from there. So this is from Darwin A. Guvarias. Apologies if I bungled your last name. Uh, this was from YouTube. He wrote, um, is there a comprehensive list of quote-unquote domains that are placebo-responsive or open-label placebo-responsive? Um. 
there are several papers. We try to summarize what has been published so far in a, a review. And uh, we describe the methodological challenges and the direction of open label studies. However, all these studies have been with uh, an end that is quite limited to try to start to address questions of phenotypes of people who respond to open label placebo. Uh, we will need larger studies and uh, before we uh, draw any conclusion about who are the people who may respond to a non-deceptive open label placebo. So we, made, we made some comments earlier about whether, or at least I did, about how whether uh, immune and CNS diseases may be um, at least among the things where there's more of a response, but not exclusively. And I also know that within psycho, within the realm of sort of psychotropic meds, um, there are there's a lower placebo response to OCD, as far as I know, in most yeah. studies, and, yeah. and also to psychosis. Um, and it's not complete, but there's a lesser response that's been pretty consistent. But I would say overall also, I mean, the, uh, res diseases, conditions for which there are placebo responses, uh, I think within mental health disorders, there's a disproportionate number. And I think part was Luana's comments earlier that it's when one, quote, mind, how you define that, is aware of the symptoms, uh, there may be more of an effect. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, this has been a wonderfully rich exchange. I really thank you all for participating. And I hope that your communal experience here is having more than a positive placebo effect. But if it's only a placebo effect of talking to others with the same interests, I'm happy that we could provide some of it and how much you provided for us. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you for having us. Yes, thank Good you. Wonderful. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.